Hi, my name is Nicolette Costanzo. I'm a sophomore at the University of Delaware, and this is my presentation on Moses Fleetwood Walker. What it was like, the life of Moses Fleetwood Walker by Nicolette Costanzo. Chapter one, family life. On the day of October 7th, 1856, in Mount Pleasant, Ohio, a baseball superstar was born by the name of Moses Fleetwood Fleet Walker. Walker grew up with a rather large household consisting of his two parents, Moses W. Walker and Caroline Walker, along with his six, possibly seven siblings. His father originally worked as a cooper, which is someone who made and repaired barrels and casks, but he eventually became a physician and Methodist Episcopal minister. His mother, on the other hand, was a midwife. The family moved from Mount Pleasant to Steubenville, where Moses and his siblings would grow up and go to school. Chapter 2 On the Come Up Following high school graduation, Moses enrolled in college at Oberlin College in 1877 to study law. Things began to quickly align for Walker's baseball career at Oberlin as he excelled on the field. He became the team's leadoff batter and catcher. As he continued to grow as a player, his grades started to suffer. Despite his lacking academic performance, Walker's athletic ability got him recruited to play baseball at the University of Michigan. Chapter 3 A Glimpse into the Future The summer before Moses transferred over to Michigan, he received an opportunity to play in a semi-professional game for the White Sewing Machine. They were scheduled to play Eclipse, a club based in Louisville, Kentucky. This is where Walker would encounter racism on the field for the first, but not last time. When the players of the Eclipse Club got word that Moses, a black man, was to play against them, they refused to play. Therefore, Walker was benched the entire game. Chapter 4. Almost There Soon to follow in the spring of 1882 was Walker's junior year of college where he would finally transfer to the University of Michigan. Moses had carried the team to a 10-3 record. He was the leading batter and highly admired for his catching ability. Shortly after the season, Walker married Bella Taylor, whom he met while going to Oberlin College. The newlywed pair had already had their first baby, Cleo Linda, on the way, but unfortunately Moses had to leave for a baseball opportunity in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Walker had played for the Newcastle Nationox, more commonly referred to as the Knox. Walker was one of the only players paid to play for the Knox. Chapter 5. The Big Leagues Soon enough, Moses was on to the big leagues. His hard work had finally paid off when he was called by Toledo to sign as their catcher. This signing was very controversial because Walker was African American and the rules prohibited African Americans from being a part of the league. The final ruling was overturned due to Walker's outstanding reputation both on and off the field. Though the league overrode the rule for Walker, this did not sit well with many people. Some teams went as far as refusing to play against Walker. Cap Anson, the first baseman of the Chicago White Stockings, was a blatant racist. He vowed to never play against a black man and he kept true to that oath when he and his team arrived in Toledo for a game. Walker was supposed to play that day but sat due to injury, so there was no confrontation this time. Chapter 6. The Racism Continues Kurt Welch and Tony Moline, Walker's own teammates, did not help with the racial issues Walker was already facing. Mullane had told the press he was the best catcher I ever worked with, but I disliked the Negro. Whenever I had to pitch to him, I used to pitch anything I wanted without looking at his signals. One day, he signaled me for a curve and I shot a fastball at him. He caught it and came down to me. He said, I'll catch you without signals, but I won't catch you if you're going across me when I give you a signal. And all the rest of that season, he caught me and caught anything I pitched without knowing what was coming. To further worsen issues, Charlie Morton, Toledo's manager, even faced pressure. Morton was contacted just weeks before a game they were scheduled to play and was told Walker was not welcome to come. They went as far as threatening to potentially kill Walker if Morton did not abide by this notice. Chapter 7. Back to the Miners Walker was released from Toledo due to injury and never again returned to the major leagues. Just before signing with the minor league team in Cleveland, Walker prepared for his second child with Bella, whose name was Thomas. Just two years after Thomas was born, the couple welcomed their third child, George. In the midst of creating a beautiful family, Moses took a job as a postal clerk. This only lasted a few months because by the springtime, he was back on the field. 
Moses signed with the Cleveland of the Western League, a minor league team, for the 1885 season. He only ended up playing 18 games with them before not only the team collapsed, but the league as well. Fleet then grasped onto the minor league team in Waterbury, Connecticut. Chapter 8. There's no place like home. After his season with the Waterbury League, Walker returned home to Cleveland and worked with his brother, Welby. Fleet had come to assume ownership of La Grande House, which was a hotel, theater, opera house. He came to earn upwards of as much as $2,000, while when playing Major League Baseball, he could only make about $10 a week. Chapter 9. On to the next chapter. The following year, Moses returned to Waterbury to play baseball again. He wound up only playing in about half of the team's games because of a series of injuries. During his time on the field, he assembled a cluster of fluctuating statistics. Despite his inconsistent statistics, Fleet came by an offer with the Newark Club in the International Association for 1887. While Walker only played in a handful of games due to injury, during the time he did play, he established career bests for himself. His batting average along with fielding percentage increased drastically. July 14th, Cap Anson returned and meant business. He and his Chicago White Stockings arrived in Newark for a game, but Anson kept good with his promise and refused to play on the same field as African Americans. On account of Anson's demand, Walker was not permitted to play. Chapter 10, Going to Syracuse. In the season to come, Newark's manager took a job with the Syracuse Stars, also of the International Association, and Walker went with him. 31-year-old Walker was the starting catcher of his new team, but lacked offensive ability. His defensive capability is what helped lead the Stars to a pennant. In 1889, Walker's next season with Syracuse, he did not play up to standards offensively or defensively, therefore he was released from his contract. Upon his release on August 23rd, Walker remained in Syracuse and began working as a railway postal clerk again. Chapter 11, April 9th. On April 9th, 1891, Walker had been involved in a fatal stabbing. A small group of drunk white men were throwing a handful of racial slurs at Walker in Syracuse. Walker, defending himself, exchanged harsh words as well. As things began to heat up, Walker stabbed the men. He was proven not guilty by a jury of 12 white men while held on trial. Later that year, Walker moved back to Steubenville where he would continue to work as a postal clerk. Chapter 12, Chaos. In 1895, Bella unfortunately passed away from cancer. Moses remarried three years later to Edna Mason, another classmate of his from Oberlin College. Just months after their marriage, Moses was yet again arrested this time for mail robbery, which he was found guilty of and spent the rest of the decade in prison, while both of his parents passed away. Chapter 13, A Renaissance Man. Upon his release, he went back home to Steubenville to live with his three children and wife. Moses worked with his brother Welby again. They operated the Union Hotel. A few years later, Moses became the manager of a local opera house in Cadiz, Ohio. He and his wife would jointly run the theater. On top of that, the two brothers worked collectively to edit The Equator, a black newspaper. Eventually, they would come to write a book, Our Home Colony, which was recognized as the most learned book a professional athlete ever wrote. Walker also produced and patented three inventions to improve the movie reel. He came to be a very well-respected businessman. Chapter 14. The rest of his days. Unfortunately, Walker lost his second wife in 1920, which led to the decision to sell the Opera House. Once he sold the Opera House, he moved to Cleveland and operated the Temple Theater with Welby. On May 11, 1924, Moses Fleetwood Walker passed away of low bar pneumonia. He was left with no direct descendants because his only grandchild passed away during infancy. Walker was buried in an unmarked grave in Union Cemetery in Steubenville, Ohio. In 1991, his grave was finally marked.